Um, so first, I wanted to thank David for joining us to give this lecture and participate in several other events throughout the day to meet and interact with students as part of the Friedman Family Program. Um, David Koch founded his company, Structural Focus, in 2001. After working at Dagen Cold for 20 years, he is a registered structural engineer in California, Arizona, Nevada, and several other states with expertise, including new structural design, seismic evaluation, historic preservation, and retrofit design. A few of David's projects include the restoration of the Wilshire Boulevard Temple, the new design of an Amazon Studios campus, and the evaluation and retrofit of the Red Bull headquarters and Google LA headquarters. He has also worked on earthquake repairs to several quad buildings at Stanford. David has served on many preservation boards and committees, is a past president of the Board of Governors of the Structural Engineers Institute of ASCE, and is now the current president of EERI. He has participated in the Friedman Family Visiting Professionals Program since 2009 and is extremely supportive of students and our involvement in EERI. Um, today, David will be discussing our role in historic building retrofits in our communities. And there will be time for questions at the end. So we ask that you hold your questions until after the lecture and we'll format the Q&A similar to the 298 seminars and the panel that we had um, earlier today. So feel free to type a Q into the chat and we'll call on you at the end of the lecture or you can just type your question directly into the chat. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to David Cock. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, when we first started talking about me giving a presentation today, I, I was asking, I think it was um, Corinne and me, about what you guys might want to talk about, what you might want to hear from me. And um, I truly, you know, I'm not here to preach by any means. And I am, um, I, one thing I've learned since starting to do these, I think my first one was, was at Georgia Tech in 2009 is that generally speaking, students don't wanna go and do a lot of technical detail in these presentations because they get that all day long from people like Deerline and others. Um, so I don't go into a lot of technical, it's really um, some lessons I've learned, some advice I can give. Um, I talk about projects and, and what we did, but it's, um, if you're here to, to do some calculations or look at some formulas, I don't have any of those. Um, the, uh, I wanna get started, but at the end, we'll talk about the future of our profession. And you can see our is bolded because it's, it's you and me and what you guys have coming ahead of you that I wanna talk about a little bit and what you can do. So that said, I'm gonna move on. Um, the first thing I am required to do, if I can get this to advance, is I, I'm required to give you a commercial um, regarding EERI. I'm going to move something here. I want to move you to the top so I can actually see what I'm looking at. That's not going to work. There you go. Um, so EERI was established in 1948. It's the, uh, it's the leading nonprofit membership organization that connects those dedicated to reducing earthquake risk. So we've been around a long time. It actually was started by a bunch of male engineers back in, in the 40s, and it was a by invitation club. And um, they, they started out with this wonderful mission to uh, research earthquake damage and try to help um, reduce risk in the future. Our new mission statement, and this is gonna be revealed in more detail at our annual meeting in a couple of weeks, but our EER, EERI provides members with the technical knowledge, leadership and advocacy skills, collaborative networks and multidisciplinary context to achieve earthquake resilience in their communities worldwide. So we've actually changed it a little bit. It used to be more focused on, on what the organization does and we've made it, um, we've changed it to focus a little bit more on the membership and trying to enable the membership to help achieve our mission. The, um, 
By belonging to EERI, you become a member of our global network of multidisciplinary professionals dedicated to reducing earthquake risk. We want you to connect with each other, we want you to learn, and we want you to lead. So those are our three main tasks that we ask our members to do for us. How I got involved with EERI is um, while working at Degenkolb in San Francisco, I experienced firsthand the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989. I, uh, once the dust settled, I realized how, uh, what a fantastic experience that was to be on the ground. Um, so I joined EERI in 1991. Uh, Henry was the original earthquake chaser and he used to always be talking about experiences at earthquakes at ground zero and showing us slides. They were slides back then, not photos and not digital. And uh, just told all those anecdotes. And so it greatly influenced me and all the other engineers around me. My earthquake experiences continued with Ferndale, uh, part of the, the, the Eureka earthquake in 1991. I happened to be in Eureka when it happened with my family at a conference and uh, went over to Ferndale and, and inspected the main street of that old historic town within hours of the earthquake, which obviously affected me. Um, I went to Costa Rica with EERI in 1992. And then obviously I packed my bags the morning of January 13th, 94 and uh, hopped on a plane and I was in and I landed in Burbank by late afternoon on that day and basically never left. Um, I became interested in, in all of these experiences. I became more and more interested in just the structural issues and I had numerous opportunities to work with other professionals and disciplines. So all of that led to my involvement in community resilience efforts at EERI, including the Concrete Coalition, and then I got involved with the city of LA and putting together their retrofit ordinances from a few years ago. I've been very active in Southern California in promoting building occupancy resumption programs. And I am doing that still today. EERI has helped me to connect. It's helped me to broaden my thinking. It's helped me with my training and it's inspired me to keep pushing toward our goals of resiliency and recovery. Our members um, include engineers, geoscientists, architects, planners, public officials, social scientists who are researchers, practicing professionals, educators, government officials, and building code regulators. ERI achieves its mission by providing member learning and networking opportunities and organizing our members into committees, projects, and chapters to conduct activities. As an example of EERI's programs is the School Earthquake Safety Initiative. This program promotes safe buildings for school children through outreach to schools and local governments. The Learning from Earthquakes program has been EERI's flagship earthquake reconnaissance program for over, over 70 years now, bringing multidisciplinary teams together in an effort to learn lessons from damaging earthquakes that can better inform earthquake engineering and risk management. The learning, the LFE travel study program is a, a recent initiative to conduct field study trips to earthquake affected regions around the world. So student membership benefits. Obviously, um, we have lectures from experts are available from the Friedman Family Visiting Professionals Program, the Distinguished Lecture Series and more. And we have competitions, including the annual seismic design competition, usually held at the annual meeting, the student paper competition, the EERI FEMA NEHERP graduate fellowships also provide opportunities for student recognition, recognition. And FEMA supports some travel grants to some of the meetings, as well as an interim internship at uh, actually working in EERI's office. So, what can you do after graduation? You can join the Student Leadership Council, which I think most of you are very aware of. You can join the Young Members Committee. You can join an EERI professional regional chapter in your area. You can help mentor a seismic design competition team. You can apply for a postgraduate internship with EERI and you can apply to join the next LFE travel study trip. So there's all kinds of opportunities. As I said, there's 
regional chapters all over the country, no matter where you go. And then in the short term, the 2021 virtual annual meeting starts on March 22nd with the Meet the Leaders networking event. Um, there's various programs that you might be interested in. They're listed here. And you can go to the webpage listed on the slide and check out the full program. And we invite you to do that. We've got a discounted registration fee for all students. So it's, I think it would be a great experience for you. Um, student, after you graduate, and I've said this earlier today, the student memberships get one, get the first year of young professional membership for free and the reduced rates for the next four years. So we don't want you as students to graduate and then forget about EERI. We want you to continue as a member of the organization. It's great for your career and you can learn more about all of that at EERI.org. So there's my commercial. Today, what I want to talk about, first of all, is an introduction to me and Destructural Focus, just our practice, so you can get an idea of the kind of work that we do. I'm going to talk about um, three historic retrofit projects that we've been working on that I are, I'm especially proud of and I love. They're, I'm pretty passionate about historic retrofit buildings of buildings. And then I want to talk about your career and the future of structural engineering. My career, first of all, I grew up in Virginia and I went to Virginia Tech. I graduated in 1980 and I knew nothing about earthquakes. Um, but I followed a girl to California, who's now my wife, and talked my way into a job at Degen Kolb Engineers. And I worked there from 1981 in the San Francisco office to 1995. Uh, as I said, the Northridge earthquake occurred in 1994. And I packed my bags and came down and eventually opened up an office for Degen Cole Pier and then another office in San Diego for 1990, in 1998 while we were um, doing a retrofit of the Hotel Del Coronado, which is in the photo on the slide. Eventually in 2001, I left Degen Cole and started my own firm, Structural Focus. And we now have a staff of 25 and we're growing. Um, we were over 5 million and 2019 in revenues, we're about four in 2020, obviously dropped back. We should be close to the 19, 2019 number in uh, 2021. The, uh, the kind of projects we do, we do a lot of commercial and office spaces, especially in the high tech industry. Um, a lot of for Netflix and Google's and Amazon. Um, we do a lot of evaluation and strengthening of existing buildings. Right now, it's about 50-50 existing versus new. Higher education, libraries, museums, historic buildings, hotels, laboratories, um, a lot of studio work, all the major studios. Occasionally, some custom residential houses, basically. They have to be very special or they've got to be very big, like $10 million and up. Um, and then B2B programs, that's our kind of our um, named building occupancy resumption programs. And we've got five programs in place for the major film studios and a few other clients in Southern California. And we've been really pushing that concept in Southern California um, really before anybody else has. So enough about us, about structural focus. Let's talk about us as structural engineers. Um, I looked this slide up many, many years ago. I think I was preparing for a, a presentation on sustainability. And I just by chance went to Wikipedia and, and noted that the, um, the definition, of course, the first part is inspect, analyze, design, plan, research. Those are all things we would expect. But I love the second sentence in that it includes, they may also consider aesthetic and social factors. And I think that means a lot. And we should think about that um, as you, you think about your career and what motivates you um, as you progress throughout your career, what you're doing. Our mission statement, structural focus, is that we do, we exist to do projects that we can be proud of and be proud of how we do them. The um, I, I preach integrity to my staff a lot. We want to do things the right way. And in fact, we 
tend to not work with clients or with other firms that we really don't feel that they're practicing at the same level of values that we are. Um, in structural engineering on my slide, I write sustainability that, that in, within structural engineering, you can be interested in these other things. And, and those include such things as sustainability, public safety, aesthetics, community resilience, recovery, preservation, and, and, and clients' needs. You know, it's really interesting to go in and sit down with a client and figure out what they need and see if we can do something to help them. So I said in there that last line, we need to understand the needs of our client and the impact that we have on the natural and the built environment. So I talk about with my, my staff a lot, I talk about let's put ourselves in the other guy's shoes. And so let's put ourselves in a, in a owner developer's shoes who owns an existing building. And just for fun, let's say it's an historic building. So it's a little bit um, a different classification for code reasons, but he's got an historic building. He's still a developer. He still needs a good investment. It's got to be, it's got to make money for him. Um, he likes historic architecture, but it needs to be a marketable property. It's got to have a use. So there's several considerations for him and he's going to go to the realtor and ask the realtor, can this building be marketable? Is somebody going to give value to it? Otherwise, why would I invest in it? He's going to ask the architect, can this building be usable? You know, is somebody going to be able to actually occupy it? and make good use of this in an efficient manner. And he's gonna ask the MEP, especially in today's age, can it be energy efficient? You know, what can we do to this building to make sure that, that we're respectful of the environment? But many, many, many times, he's gonna to go to the structural engineer and say, can this building be safe? Because sometimes in their minds, they look at that as the deal breaker. And you know, I, I, if I know them well enough or I think they have the right personality, I will often say to them, hey, we can make this building safe if you have enough money, you know, and we don't defy gravity basically. So the, the question is, or, or, or the point is that we many times are the deal breaker. We're the ones that the rest of them they can deal with, but sometimes from a structural aspect or they're, they're scared of the structural aspect of the building and we often end up being the deal breaker. So five things we do at Structural Focus to try to get through that is we try, first of all, to think like our client, like I said. We try to explain and use performance objectives because it's not just making the building safe, even though that might be what they initially ask. It's actually about What's the lifespan of the building? How's it going to perform? How much is it going to cost to repair it? Is it going to be repairable? When can it get back in operation? All of those kinds of things that I know you guys talk about and you, you're aware of. We want to try to reuse the building. We don't want to just tear it down and, and rebuild it. If you look at embodied energy and all and, and carbon, all those things, it doesn't make sense. If you can make a building reusable, you can generally do it for uh, using less energy than it would be to tear it down or rebuild the building. We want to communicate clearly at all times with them. And then um, from my perspective, I like to design elegantly. And you might say that's in a simple manner. And I want to design authentically. And the, the one thing I hate, and, and people kid me about this, is when people try to fake the structure, you know, they do things that that they think look structural, but it's not really the structure. Why not make the structure look good enough that you want to keep it exposed and it's authentic? And by the way, that also saves energy because you're not covering it up with sheetrock or other uh, other finishes to make it look good. Our philosophy, the way I like to think about it is uh, when we're looking at seismic retrofit option, there's, all, there's really kind of three ways you can tackle it. We can add new strengthening and rigidity to protect the brittle material. So you might just put in shear walls or braces, a very conventional retrofit 
if you go that way. Or you can add some new elements to supplement the existing. So you might go in and just um, modify or strengthen or add ductility to the connections so that they can go along for the ride. Obviously, if you have brittle, brittle, special brittle materials or finishes, that may not be the best way to go, but it is an option. It is one way that you can do a retrofit. And then the third way to be would be basically the, to just modify the dynamic response of the building. So you could base isolate it, or you could add dampers or whatever the case. So it's really, you can also do a combination of all these three things, but those are kind of your three basic choices. Now, when you go to a, a historic building, we have a philosophy that we build on those three other options. And these are, first of all, we want to respect the existing structure. We're not just going to assume it's not worth anything. We're going to try to use as much of the structural system as we can and, and do that in combination with the, with the uh, new lateral force resisting system. We need to be very clear about our performance objectives, what we're actually trying to achieve. I'll talk about the historical building code in a minute, but basically the historical building, building code is just trying to keep the building from collapsing as a minimum. And of course, you know that the, the basic building code, the uniform building code that we use or the CBC, where it's basically a life safety kind of code. So we can, we can talk about performance objectives and try to do better than that, even when we're dealing with historic buildings. We need to understand the importance of the building and its elements, you know, the architectural part of it, the historical part, the contextual part, the social part. We need to understand that. We, we are not working in a silo. We're working with the whole team. We want to utilize the existing structural properties in combination with the new strengthening. I touched on that with the respecting the structure, but we want to incorporate that into our new design. We want to repair and we want to supplement where possible instead of replacing. Um, if there's any way when I go into an historic building, I can repair it and make it as good um, as it needs to be the, to meet the performance objective, then that's much better than just tearing it out and, and replacing it. And then according to the National uh, the um, Secretary of Interior Standards for Preservation, we should try to strive for reversibility. And the, the point there is that if we do something to the building in 20 years from now, technology changes or there are different needs or the performance objective changes, they can reverse what we did and do it in a different manner. And that's in respect to the historic nature of the building. And that's built in, that's a basic basic philosophy of the, the, um, the interior standards for preservation. So there's another part of the approach to dealing with preservation. And that is that many historic buildings, the client that owns the buildings don't have enough money. And um, it, it Generally speaking, that's almost always the case. It's like, okay, we know we want to preserve this building. We know we want to actually restore it to museum quality. That would be great, but we can't afford it. So um, first of all, time, you don't have to do that instantly. It can, it can take time. You can spread that work out. So there's actually a whole section in the, um, in the standards again called stabilization. So when you can't do the full retrofit right away, it's not immediately feasible. We always want to stabilize first. And stabilizing first means that um, we want to prevent future deterioration until we get a chance to fix the building. So sometimes it's just making it watertight. Uh, we're working on a, on a couple of big historic buildings now owned by the county of LA at Rancho Los Alamigos. And uh, we're basically putting in some temporary shoring where needed, where we think um, some instability might, might be coming up, not necessarily for seismic, but just to keep things from falling down. 
and um, where the major part of the work is putting a new roof on and trying to keep the water out because as water gets into the structure, it's going to deteriorate it further. And usually they put a time frame. They say, okay, let's, let's do stabilization for 10 years or whatever the case may be. When they do that, then we will try, we'll put a plan together and we'll try to um, pick out different mitigation measures. And I call this the menu approach. So we will have identified deficiencies in the building and then we'll put together this menu of, of mitigation measures and we'll try to prioritize it whenever we can. So then when we go to the next step, retrofit by priorities when full retrofit is not immediately feasible and those priorities would start with falling hazards and exits. So even if we, even if we, um, we're, we're starting on the retrofit and we've, we've gone beyond just the stabilization, we wanna tackle the falling hazards first and make sure that, um, that we're not, people are not put in danger. It's very much a, a safety issue and we also want to make sure that the exits are not blocked in the event of shaking. And then finally, um, as we do our work, we want to be very surgical when possible. So sometimes we can get in and, and I was involved with the Memorial Chapel at Stanford and you can't tell that any retrofit to that building was done. It's entirely invisible because we went in with this scheme to be very, very surgical when we did that work. That, that building was pretty severely damaged after the Loma Prieta earthquake. The applicable codes and standards, again, the Secretary of Interior standards for the rehabilitation of historic buildings. It protects historic buildings. That's the main purpose of those standards. And uh, some of the professionals are actually, that are to be involved in a preservation project are actually, uh, they have to be um, certified to as, as qualified to do the work specified into the standards. Uh, interestingly, structural engineers are not included in that. So unfortunately, sometimes structural engineers get into, the, uh, get into a project where they're very good structural engineers, but if they're not used to working with historic buildings, they really don't they're really not sure about what they're doing. And we've, we've been brought in to, to peer review and to help out occasionally. The other document is the California Historical Building Code, which is one of the few, if not the only state historic building codes in the country. It's, um, it's written um, with objectives. It's, it's mainly a general performance objective kind of um, of code. There's, it provides waivers to other code requirements, for, you know, fire and life safety and accessibility and some others. And it's intentionally very broad and not prescriptive. So there's wording in there that uh, I'm on the committee that, that writes that code and actually enforces that code. And it's time to rewrite it. Um, but it's, it's basically says that the performance objective, the minimal performance objective is collapse prevention. So it's even less than a life safety um, kind of objective. And now we need, to, we need to be a little bit more specific and correlate that to the other standards are, that are out there now for existing buildings. So I'm at 434, so I think we're on target. The first project I want to talk about is Wilshire Boulevard Temple. It's, um, it was built in 1926. It's a steel frame encased in concrete. It's on the National Register. It's the largest dome in Southern California. It's even larger than the observatory. Um, it's on Wilshire Boulevard and it's a, um, it's a beautiful temple. Back in probably 12 years ago, they started noticing that every morning when they were vacuuming the carpet in the sanctuary, they were finding plaster chips. And um, I got a call from uh, Brenda Levin who does a lot of work. She's a member of the congregation and she does a, a lot of work, very uh, high-end preservation and restoration work in Southern California. 
and asked me to come take a look. And we, we came up and looked at it and noted that the, the edge of the plaster ceiling inside the dome, it's a concrete dome with a plaster ceiling suspended. Along the edge where the two came together, there was a lot of cracking in there in that area. And uh, we believe it was due to temperature changes. They had a very poor air conditioning system in there. So it got really hot and then it would get cold. Um, it was also due to earthquake shaking. Um, and it really wasn't um, a, a good scenario. They're, they had not taken any of that movement into account. So we ended up, that led to more and more evaluations and we ended up analyzing the entire building. The problem with the, the building we found was that there was not a direct load path for uh, the inertia movement, the inertia um, uh, forces up at the top of the building all the way down to the foundation. In fact, it, this, this is a SAP model um, from 10 or so years ago, but all the blue is the areas that were overstressed as a result of our analysis. And you can see they're kind of coming down the dome and then they go to the outside of the building and then they go across a deck and then they go down the walls and then they go across a deck and, and they're kind of chasing their way down. When we presented this to the client and told them the amount of work that we would have to do to fix all those distressed areas, they kind of freaked out and started talking about all the, the costs and the disruption and everything else that we would have to do to that building. Well, the fundamental issue is that the buildings on the 45 degree bias corners, those are concrete, the, the walls in those corners are discontinuous. They don't go down. They go down as non-structural walls around the sanctuary. And so we, we tried to convince them. You can see a little bit better in the photo down in the bottom right. So um, I threw it out there that maybe we should look at just continuing those walls down to the base as opposed to just strengthening the areas that were showing up in blue. So it was, it was really about completing a fundamental load path. And they agreed to that. We figured out a way to do it. And that involved choosing those walls. This is below those walls. This is where they're continuous and are just hollow, uh, hollow voids inside the building. On the far side of this wall you're looking at, there's the very um, special historic, um, significant, significantly historic painted murals on the, on the backside of this. And uh, this area that we're standing in right now is the, after some finishes have been removed, obviously a much less significantly historic area. And so what we did was put in a waterproof system to protect the, you can see it on the right, to protect the backside of that plaster system, the significant plaster system, put the rebar in and shot put uh, applied shotcrete to this wall. And by doing that, we were able to continue the load path down to the foundations. And we didn't have to do, we eliminated like 90% of that work to those blue areas in the previous slide. There was some work still, uh, just general repairs to the concrete on the outside of the building, but that was not structural work. In the right-hand slide, we did need to strengthen a couple of the membranes, a, a couple of the uh, diaphragms because of the offset, we had to get some loads delivered to the other side. And we did that with um, FRP. And then this was, uh, there's the FRP applied to the top of the concrete deck. And then we went over top of that with a waterproofing membrane. The rosette uh, window over the main entrance. That is about a 20 foot diameter cast stone, unreinforced cast stone structure. And we were very nervous about that, especially because it was over the, the main entrance. Very heavy, very brittle. And we carefully had that dismantled 
and we came up with a design where we were we we either slit the members in half, pulled them apart, put rebar in the center, and then put them back, or we just cored right through the middle of them so we could tie all the rebar together. So now it's a reinforced uh, rosette window uh, with um, where we utilized all the original elements. We did not replicate any of the elements there, we're able to put them all back, but now it's fully reinforced. And then this is actually a view of the ceiling which started the whole ball game. Um, the top left photo is looking at the access ladder up into the dome, which was a pretty exciting climb. The bottom left is the showing the system of the suspended plaster dome and the dome above is concrete. So it was all suspended by wires and by straps. And then the bottom right is the a close up of where the straps and the wires attach to the uh, furring system. And you see all those kind of white gray uh, gobs that are there. That's, those are actually fibers. Uh, in some buildings, they actually used to use horsehair fibers and they but they could be hemp, they could be any kind of fibers where they would tie <coughs> the subsystem to the red channel system and they would just encase it in, uh, in plaster to protect it from moisture, from temperature changes and everything else so that the fibers would not decay. Uh, we supplemented all of that and felt that it was very, very important to make sure that that system uh, survived. We also went around the edge and we cut an expansion joint at the bottom of that dome. As I talked about, that's where most of the damage was occurring. So we gave it an, an ability. We first of all braced it laterally, but then we also gave it an ability to move just slightly without causing any more serious damage. The upper right is a photo of, of the ceiling from the inside. And that's pre-cleaning. Um, there was probably, I don't know, a quarter of an inch of black dust in every one of those little coffers up there. Once we got close and built built a scaffolding, scaffolding system up there, you couldn't believe how dirty we found everything to be. It had never been built, never been cleaned since it, it was constructed in 1926. So you can imagine. So um, that's what it looked like when we were done. Uh, much brighter, much, much cleaner, and again, invisible. We couldn't, we were very surgical with the work that we did. In fact, those, those pairs of columns on either side, the right and the left, we actually were able to reinforce those columns also in a very surgical manner. Um, and we were, uh, we did some bracing up above those so that that top spandrel was braced out of plane. Um, so you can't see any of the work we did. So I, I'm very proud of that, that we were able to do it in a surgical manner. And it's a beautiful building now. They're investing a lot of money on the campus. The, the congregation was diminishing and uh, now it's growing. They put in a, a, a school and a community center and it's become a very thriving uh, co congregation again. The next project I wanna talk about is the proper hotel. This is a, um, an, again, a building, um, it's on a prominent corner. It's about six blocks from the beach in Santa Monica. Um, it was built in 1926. It's an all concrete building. Um, it's uh, seven, seven blocks of the beach. It was part of a new development. The owner owned the parking lot behind and then this building, it um, hadn't been touched really since it was um, other than a few earthquake repairs after, after uh, Northridge, it's designated historical building. And uh, the plan was to build a new modern hotel behind it and interconnect the two. So this would actually become part of that new modern hotel. It's eight stories tall. It's got an irregular plan shape, which I'll show you in a minute, and some major vertical offsets at the second floor line. The, um, the, the new hotel next door immediately adjacent included a three-level subterranean garage. There was some damage in, in uh, 
the 94 Northridge earthquake, as I just as I mentioned, and the repairs were pretty bad. They didn't. Uh, they added a shear wall, but they kind of neglected to attach it to the rest of the building. Um, and the building itself was in pretty bad condition. I'd say fair, fair to poor is being generous. Um, in plan, the, the square shape is actually the second floor level. And then everything above that third through eighth stories is the kind of this Y shape. So there's a major uh, offset at that level and those walls of that Y shape are basically discontinuous below the second floor line. So we had that major vertical irregularity that we had to deal with. Also, the building was in pretty bad shape, as I said. Uh, the, the photo on the left is on the interior, and I don't know how well you can see that, but those are pretty thin concrete walls, six to eight inches thick. And when we removed the plaster, you could see that water had been leaking in through the windows forever. And there was a lot of rebar damage. There was a lot of voids from the concrete, concrete cracking, um, just in, in pretty bad condition. The, uh, and you can see some of that on the exterior along um, that photo. You can see along the left jam of that window, I think there's a lot of, of cracking and discoloration. And that was pretty typical throughout the building. One thing I wanted to point out is, uh, as I said, there's this three levels of subterranean parking that was to be built immediately adjacent to this building. And they're starting their one one level down there, I believe, on the left in that that photo. You can see the excavation shoring right up against the wall. The city of Santa Monica was very because it's a historic building. They were very adamant about protecting the historic building, and we had to put together a mitigation plan. That mitigation plan for for doing this was to protect the building, and it included. Um, several measures that we as the structural engineer had to perform. Um, it started with a, a very thorough photographic and, and uh, video survey of the existing building. The worst thing, and this has happened before to me, the worst thing you can do with an historic building and they're doing something nearby that could damage it is not have a good baseline of the damage, the existing damage before you get into the construction because it's always arguable about how big was that crack before and how big is that crack now. So what you want to do is do a very specific survey so you have all that information. We also set up vibration monitoring. And if the monitoring went over, if the vibration was recorded at a, a particular level, then everybody was informed and the contractor had to stop construction immediately until they figured out what that uh, vibration, what was causing that vibration and what we could do to, to lower the level of the vibration. I was sent to notice immediately and I would have to call and say, okay, what's going on? Um, there was several, we had to inspect different things throughout the process. We had to do a monthly um, walk through the building to look for damage, to see if there are any changes in damage. All those things were necessary and they're all a great idea if you're working under these circumstances where you've got a building, whether it's historic or not, it's a good idea to have that baseline of the building so you don't have to fight about the damage later on. The, as you can see, um, once they took away all the storefronts, there was a pretty, not only did we have a plan irregularity as I, pointed out, I mean, uh, uh, the, we not only had the discontinuous shear walls up from up above, but there was no perimeter shear walls either. I mean, there was nothing below. This is a major soft story. And it really struck me when I was out there at this one job walk and I took this photo and I realized how open this, this entire building was. And it was a darn good thing we were gonna come in and, and add some strengthening to this building. This is just a photo, it's hard to explain, but it, it has to do with dragging the loads from that upper tower into the, uh, at that second floor line into the new shear walls, which we're adding at the bottom floor 
to take care of that irregularity. And then this is more of that. We used FRP a lot in this building. We used it not only for drag members, we used it for vertical strengthening of the floor systems. We used it for um, adding um, uh, confinement to the columns throughout the building. That's what that is over on the right. Uh, these buildings, these, uh, these columns had some, I believe their ties are like number threes at 12 inches on center. So they clearly were not going to be able to take the uh, act in the, duct, the ductile behavior that we would want them to. We also basically FRP'd all the perimeter walls up in the tower. So they had to go through, you know, based on that photo that I showed earlier, there was a lot of patching they had to do a lot of prep work they had to do to these walls. And then we went through and FRP'd all of those surfaces. Um, there's a lot of good firms out there doing this now, a lot of good subcontractors that are experts at installing the FRP. And basically we give them the performance criteria, we give them the loads that we're trying to, to uh, resist in all the elements and they come through and they design the, the FRP system and then put it in place for us. It's a, uh, the, the greatest part of the, the biggest advantage to that system. It's not necessarily less expensive, but it's only maximum of a quarter of an inch thick. So you save a lot of space and um, uh, you can cover it up pretty easily. So that's the finished photo. You can see it's a lot cleaner on the outside. It's, it's not quite finished. The barrier, the construction barrier is up and you can clearly tell <laughs> the new hotel versus the, the historic building, which also meets the Secretary of Interior. I think David might've cut out. In California, this is right across. Uh -oh. Hey, David. Yeah, you we lost. lost you for a moment there, right when you were comparing the old versus the new building. Like you were saying, the Secretary of Interior didn't like it very much. No, I, I'll I'll re say that. I'm sorry about that. I don't know why my Wi-Fi all of a sudden went bad. Um, what I was saying is this is kind of a prime example of in the Secretary of Interiors, it recommends that the addition never try to replicate the original. And that's clearly not a problem here. They, they meet that criteria pretty easily. That's a very contemporary design on the left there compared to the original building on the right. So are you still with me? Everybody okay? My wife must be doing, my wife is also working from home and she works with me. So she's probably doing something with her laptop right now. Um, the last project I want to talk about is Masonic Temple. Um, this is in Glendale in Southern California. And it's um, across the street from the Americana big shopping area, if any of you have been there. It's been sitting empty for decades. Um, it's an historical landmark with very limited construction documents. We hardly had any information about this building. Uh, it was bought by the developer of the Americana, who uh, carries a whole lot of political clout in Southern California. He's a very, very demanding client, and so much so that this is the most aggressive schedule I have ever seen or worked on. We were actually hired on May 1st, and the tenant moved in on January 1st, eight, eight months later. Usually we would take eight months just to design it, but we had to design it and then get it built. Um, it's a structural steel frame and it's embedded in concrete with, and the building has significant planned torsional issues. It's, it had been sitting empty for decades. It was gutted many years ago. Nobody really knows when. Um, so that, that was both good and bad because obviously there had been some pretty impressive finishes in that building. Masonic Temple buildings are interesting. It's uh, basically a nine-story building, but the, all, the, all the stories are double height, 
because they were mostly gathering uh, halls, banquet halls, performance halls. Um, this is the top floor with these beautiful um, ornate wooden trusses and, and light fixtures up there. This is actually when um, the developer was talking to his, his former fraternity brother from the university about leasing this building from him if he renovated the building. And they're standing in this space, you know, fantasizing about what this place could look like. The, uh, that's a close up of those trusses. Those trusses are actually non structural. They're steel trusses up above those. And so these, these wooden trusses just stick down into the space. On the right, um, that looks like lateral bracing. What that is actually is that's a hung mezzanine. That mezzanine doesn't have columns below it, it's hung from the, the floor above. And that bracing, this is all original. That bracing was put in there to stabilize that from a lateral perspective. So um, we performed a, a detailed seismic analysis, actually a nonlinear analysis, and torsion was very problematic on this building. Um, they wanted to add some windows on the long walls, the two longitudinal walls, and then there were some offsets in the back, a vertical discontinuity. And um, the front is fairly open. There was not a lot of rigidity in that, on that front elevation. So this building really did want to, to twist when it was hit with lateral loads. So we ended up strengthening a lot of shear walls and we added a lot of shear walls and we connected all the mezzanines. There were mezzanines all over the place and we added some new mezzanines. But the interesting part was by playing with the window openings, especially the windows on those longitudinal walls, we were able to balance the, the building better, the lateral system better and get some symmetry. And we significantly reduced the torsional response by, you know, by adding some of the other shear walls in some key places, fixing that, non, that uh, discontinuous shear wall and adding some openings that are properly detailed we were able to make this building perform much better and we were meeting what the architect and the owner wanted. So here's some before and after photos. That's that uh, same mezzanine I was showing earlier. This is the space afterwards. I was actually walking through it and the tenants were going, that is the coolest structure that you added to the building. And I was like, we didn't add that. That's part of the original. And then that top story that we looked at before, of course, the tenant, the future tenant still standing there looking at it all by himself um, in that photo above. And those, those are not actually windows you see on the left and the right and in the back there. Those are photos, large prints of what the view would be if there was a window there before we cut a hole in that wall. So that was trying to convince him that he wanted to do this space. The construction is on the right. You can see we added a mezzanine all the way around it. Um, it was an interesting design because they said they wanted this, this mezzanine around, that, around the perimeter of the space. And I said, OK, where are we going to put the columns to support the mezzanine? And we're also going to have to strengthen the floor. And they said, oh, no, we, we can't have columns. And I said, well, we could hang it from above and strengthen the steel trusses. And they said, yes, we want to do that. So that's what we ended up doing is, is uh, here's a uh, photo, or this is actually a rendering, I think. I don't think this is a real one. But you can see the tie rods coming down um, around the inside rim of that mezzanine. Those are going up to the steel trusses, which are relatively easy to retrofit. It's not that big a deal to strengthen uh, steel trusses, especially when they're like double angle trusses. Um, and then they, they restore it, they put the ceiling back. You can see the wood trusses are still in place. This is a, a totally a hoteling space. So nobody has a permanent office in this building. They all walk in, check in with the receptionist, go to their locker, get they, their stuff, and then go find a space they want to work in that day, which nowadays might make sense after COVID. So there's the building all done. CBRE is the main tenant. There's uh, some tenants in the, in the bottom couple of stories. And then there's an adjacent building that we designed also a retail building. But it's a very, it's a beautiful building. And you can see the, 
the nice board forming on the right. So those are my three case studies. Um, I want to talk, how are we doing time-wise? We're probably getting there. I want to talk pretty quickly about the future of structural engineering in your career. Um, I want to point out a couple of things. Number one is that um, you can be in structural engineering and there's several different paths you can take. We've talked about this in some of the sessions earlier today, but um, you know, if you're, if you're even going to do a consulting career, kind of like what we do, you still have to have a, a bunch of different skills and you can specialize in some of these skills, but you've got to do, be able to do the calculations and the analysis and the conceptualizing. You need to have some vision. You need to have some imagination and some creativity. I think retrofitting existing buildings takes more creativity than designing a new building because you've got some parameters, some restrictions there that you need to work with and be able to adjust your thinking. It needs coordination. You need to have some negotiation skills. Believe me, we negotiate with architects all the time about what they want and what we can give them or what we can do for them. You have to have good communication skills, both writing and speaking. You have to be good with people. You can't be a jerk. You have to actually get along with people and you have to have some business sense if you're gonna go on and go to a senior position in running uh, a consulting firm. So um, I urge you to think about all of those things and choose one of those passions. I also urge you to help us elevate our profession. Um, as I said before, um, we can be the deal breaker. So we need to understand, or you need to understand your role as, as an engineer in the big picture and strive to make a difference. Understand that you can be the deal breaker and that you do have a lot of that. I will, I've told this many times that working on the West Coast in a high seismic area, we get a lot more respect here, I believe, than we do if we worked in a lower seismic area because they will listen to us when we're at the table. If we say, I'm sorry, we have to have a shear wall there, then they're going to pay attention to what we're saying where they're, they're going to get pushed around. The structural engineers are going to get pushed around a little bit more where they don't have seismic issues. So we are in a, if you're gonna work on the West Coast, I think there's a real advantage there to us in our profession. You also need to remember that your clients need your input to make them successful. There's a lot of projects. Um, I mean, we have a lot of clients now, I've been working with them so long that, you know, an example, I was at Warner Brothers and we were talking about a new building, a new design, and they were, they were getting into the interiors and I'm still sitting at the table. And uh, the architect shows a few carpet samples, believe it or not, to the client. And the client turns to me and she says, what do you like? And I said, well, first of all, I'm a structural engineer. Second of all, I'm colorblind, but I like the one on the right. And she went, yeah, I like that one too, and kept on going. So, I mean, it's, you know, once you're a trusted advisor, you're a trusted advisor. And, and that's what we strive for with all of our clients. Don't be afraid to speak up, be a good communicator. People tend to listen to us. I've, I've, uh, I served on the board at my country club and there was an issue that came up and I, I approached it as an engineer and I made a suggestion and everybody went, oh, that's the solution. And then the president, after we were done, he said, we should have an engineer on the board all the time. Because people, you know, doctors don't think that way, for instance. I mean, there's, it's, we think in a way that we can solve problems and we can help out. Be active in your community, make it stronger, which is kind of relevant to what I just said. And then be active in your profession because it affects your future. It's very important. You need to be thinking about what's down the road in our, our profession, what's going to happen. Speaking of that, um, I was recently the president of the Structural Engineers Institute of ASCE. In 2013, there was a document written by ASCE called A Vision for the Future of Structural Engineering and Structural Engineers, A Case for Change. In that document, they tried to project ahead 25 years for where we will be, our profession. And they identified areas that we need to work on and came up with a few strategies. There was about seven different strategies, if I remember. Um, 
in 2019, which it was published, we started the effort five years later. We took a good look at that. I was chairman of that committee. We took a good look at that 2013 document and tried to assess the progress that we had made. We made some adjustments. We added a few of the uh, initiatives to that. We're now with 10 initiatives. And that, that um, document was published in 2019. There's a photo of it on the right there. You can find these both on the SCI, on the ASCE SEI website. Um, we actually took it a step further. There's really three organ national organizations for structural engineers. There's SEI, which is an individual membership organization, NCSEA, which is the National Council for Structural Engineers Associations. Those are all the state, um, the, the equivalents of SEOC. Those are the state versions and they all form up to create one big organization. So that's a organization of organizations. And then there's the Council of American Structural Engineers. That's a association of businesses, of firms. We got together and uh, the leadership, which had not been really collaborating or even communicating with each other very well, we took that document of the vision and we formed our own uh, uh, joint vision together so that we're all pushing in the same direction and we meet on a uh, by every six months semi semi yearly I guess semi annually basis the leadership gets together goes through that list reports what they're doing in each one of these initiatives so we're all pushing in the same direction so for the future of structural engineering I'm almost done here um, I'm optimistic I'm an optimistic guy, but I, um, I love our profession. I think what's happening now for us, there's going to be a demand for us because resilient, resilience and functional recovery are pressuring for better structural performances and new and existing structures. That's just the philosophy. We have to do performance-based engineering and we need to keep pushing for better performance. There's always going to be a demand for new structures because of our increasing population. And there's also going to be more pressure, you know, through sustainability and economic and societal reasons to reuse existing buildings. So there's going to be a market for um, renovating and, re and reusing buildings. And personally, I think the way we think we're essential for fixing the world. You know, I don't know if we aren't necessarily going to create a vaccine, but we're certainly going to help with uh, provide the systems that are going to take care of that, as well as all the other things that are going on. So I'm done. Um, some references there, obviously, EERI, ASCE, SEI, um, our own web page, my email. That's a photo of Amazon, the new Amazon Studios that we're just completing construction now in Culver City. And I am open for questions as long as y'all want to talk. Great. Thanks, David, for the very insightful presentation. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about your approach to historic retrofits and design philosophies and uh, words of wisdom at the end um, with the future of structural engineering. So if anyone has questions, then feel free to type a Q into the chat and we'll call on you. Uh, Matthew, you have the first question. Hey, David, thank you for that presentation. Um, I'm also colorblind, so a lot of similarities here. And I also live in Glendale, so that's awesome seeing that project. Great. And so we're talking a lot about the future of structural engineering. And I wanted to see um, where do you see the future in terms of gender equality and the diversity? And what can we do as young engineers to help with that equality between men and women in the different races? Um. Well, first of all, let me let me tell you that all the professional organizations, EERI, SEOC, everybody, SEI, is all very, very serious about um, diversity, equality, and inclusion. Um, they they all have initiatives, and in, in our uh, just speaking for EERI, um, they we our new strategic plan. We have five initiatives, and the first one is to get our our operational infrastructure up to date because we've been struggling with several things. 
but number two is DEI. And we want that to be the, the philosophy of promoting DEI. We want it to be throughout our everything that we do. So that's, that's from that level, from my own firm level. And I've been saying this for years. I bet in the last 10, maybe 15 years, if we take all the resumes that we've been getting, and I'm just looking at it from just a, a quality standpoint. And um, if you take all the, the resumes that we get, easily eight out of the 10 top resumes we get every year are female. And um, every once in a while we have to like, uh-oh, uh, should we be looking at a male? Should we be, you know, should I interview more males? We, uh, we're about 50, our engineering staff is about 50-50. Um, the, we are also doing what we can with ACE. I think, I believe that the only way we're going to really um, well, I shouldn't say the only way. One of the ways that we're going to attract more a more diverse collection of engineers into our profession is starting at a, a young age. We have to be working with those um, with a diverse group and trying to attract everybody into our profession. And by doing that, we should attract a more diverse workforce. Um, we also, at the other side, we need to have more leaders that are a more diverse group of leaders out there as an examples to our younger people. So when they go to a engineering webpage, they all these all the leaders of these firms don't look like me necessarily. You know, they're they're going to see a diverse collection of leaders that are out there. Um, I, it's going to take time. And um, I, I actually, I was in my office last week after there was a webinar, I was talking to two of my uh, most promising young project engineers who are both female and one black, one is black and the other one is blonde. And we were talking about that and talking about that, um, that the times are gonna change the next 10 years. I think we're gonna see a big swing and of diversity, increased diversity, both in gen, um, you know, in male, female versus um, all the other diversification categories. And she brought up, one of them brought up the fact, it's like, yeah, we've got to figure out what are females going to do if they're interested in having children? And that's a great point. I mean, there's, if you look at the, st the stats from the SE3 project, um, there's still a big discrepancy in senior executive salaries between males and females. And I think that is because of the childbearing years. There, there's a pause, often a pause, not every time, but enough to affect the, the statistics. And um, one of our principals is actually in the hospital right now having a baby. And... Uh, you know, it's, I, I'm determined it's not going to slow down her career one way or the other. We're going to make sure it doesn't because I see here, she's going to be a senior leader in our firm very shortly. And um, I think it's just piece by piece. It's just going to have to happen. But again, we got to feed it from the bottom and we got to, we got to provide leadership from the top. That's how I think it's going to have to happen. I'm so happy that people are asking, you know, that's just awesome. Great. Thanks, Hopefully I didn't David. stick my foot in my mouth anywhere there. You have to be careful. Great. Thanks for your response. It's definitely an important topic and something that we need to talk about in structural engineering. Um, if anyone has more questions, then Feel free to type into the chat. Tamika. Thanks, David, for a very interesting presentation. Um, yeah. Towards the beginning, you were talking about the California Historical Building Code, which I've interfaced with very brief, like very little, but I am kind of interested in learning more about it. I was just one question I had, maybe a two-part question is um, 
in the current with the current historical building code is there any difference in um, standards for residential occupancy versus other occupancy i know you mentioned that collapse prevention is kind of the the standard for historical buildings versus life safety and then towards the end of the presentation you mentioned um, the importance of resilience and functional recovery towards the kind of the future of our practice and i was wondering as you mentioned getting again um, how you envision that the historical building code will be uh, revised in the near future if you see any um, pieces of that kind of resilience functional recovery sort of ideal seeping into historical buildings even though i'm sure it's probably among the most difficult buildings for that to for that philosophy to penetrate that that actually is a really great question um first of all your your question about historical building code in the stri in the structural chapters there's no uh differentiation regarding the um residential versus uh, a, a non-residential building the only um the only provisions in the historical building in the in the structural section has to do with with when you go to assembly occupancy or essential facilities or schools then um, you need to bring it up to a slightly higher standard and uh, but it's still extremely general and and that really is a negotiation with a building official and an interpretation for those higher standards but there's nothing in there about residential there might be, um, I don't know about the rest of the historical building code in the, in the other sections, whether there's any differentiation between uh, residential and non-residential. Your question about um, performance objectives and functional recovery and all that stuff with the historical building code. Um, the code was first written in, I think, 1989-ish, somewhere in that, before my time. And um, the board, the State Historical Building Safety Board is composed of about 24 individuals, including two structural engineers. And the two structural engineers on that board are the original two structural engineers. And um, I'm the alternate. I've been the alternate to the SEOC appointed structural engineer now for over 10 years. And um, it's pretty obvious to me that we need to take a good hard look at the structural provisions. For one thing, I think we need to now that we have so much better definitions of the different performance objectives that are out there. I think the uh, structural provisions need to, to refer to those well-defined performance objectives now. Just, just if, even if they just refer to the one, um, that would be a big step. I fought in 2012 is the last time we rewrote it. And I fought just to get the words in there somewhat related to co collapse prevention was a big improvement. I think we can go a lot further and I think when we have that discussion, which I'm pushing for, um, I don't know if I'm going to have to wait till somebody retires or not. Um, but when I'm I'm going to push for this when I when we do get the opportunity, is to consider multiple performance objectives. And the, but the philosophy that we have to remember when we're dealing with that code is that when they first wrote it is they didn't want to baby basically throw the baby out with the bathwater. They didn't want to ruin a wonderful historic structure by saving it. You know, you don't want to go into a great stone building by putting a shear wall in there to cover up all the stone while you're trying to save it. So that's the problem. And so back then, which, you know, was 30 years ago, they were thinking, let's just convince people to do the minimal amount of work we possibly can to reduce the chance that we're going to lose this building if it's if it's ever shaken by an earthquake. Um, I think we're more a lot more sophisticated now. It still is the right. Um, it's it's the what's the word? I can't think of the. It's the right idea, you know. A little bit is better than nothing, but we still should consider doing more or leave a pathway. There's actually a paragraph in the code that says 
the structural engineer should talk to the owner, and I'm paraphrasing, about they, they should discuss options regarding higher, higher levels of performance or something like that. It's a very, it's like a, even though it's in a building code, it's a very, it's almost a recommendation, if you will. But I, that's gonna be the next generation is to try to figure out how to get performance objectives in there um, without, without throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Make sense? It does, thank you. Yep. Great, um, Corinne, you have the next question. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Um, so I've like heard other presentations on historic buildings and historic preservation before, but I've never heard the bit about like making your modifications reversible. And I find that super interesting. Um, and kind of a two part question. One, how does that kind of play out? How does that affect the kinds of modifications you make? Um, when is that like easy or difficult? And then two, I was just wondering if you had any fun horror stories of um, non reversible modifications from other structural engineers that you've had to deal with. Uh, to think about the horror stories, the, the, the first part of your, the first answer, um, obviously, if you go into a building, let's just say it's a two story stone building with wood floors. Um, obviously, if you need to increase the shear strength, you might just put in some brace frames. They're, they're obvious, they're there, they're, they are what they are, they're not trying to be um, look like they're original or anything else. And then removing them is pretty easy, right? You just go in and unbolt them and you carry away. That's the best reversibility there is. Where it gets to be um, on the other extreme, if we were to go in and uh, we were to come up with some kind of center coring solution, which is not easy in a stone building, I should have used a brick building, but and there's a, a methodology called center coring where you go to the very top of the wall and you core the full height of the wall down to the foundation. It's usually a three or a four inch core. And there's some companies that are very good at doing that. They, they might only waver a quarter of an inch over a 40 foot height. And then you put in a, um, a, a pretty good size rebar and some epoxy grout and you cast that in there and you do that at four feet on center. And what that does is it helps, obviously, with the outer plane strength of that wall. It also provides some, I'll call it confinement. It's not really confinement, but it does help in the uh, in-plane shear strength of that wall. That's not reversible, but it's also invisible. So it's actually a pretty good solution. So I, you know, there's no reason that somebody would want to come in and, and tear that out. Now, the bad ones are if, like I said, you have a stone building and somebody wants to go in and put in a, a shotcrete shear wall on the interior face of the wall. That's probably not reversible. It's probably affecting, it is affecting what may or may not be a significant um, element in the building. Um, sometimes that's your only choice. And what we do then is we there before we start a project like that, we'll get a preservation consultant to come in and they will identify the significant features of the building that that uh, that uh, that make the building eligible to be designated as an historic building. And so what we try to do again, this is part of the creative part dealing with the restrictions is then we try to come up with a system that's not gonna mess up any of those significant um, features that would cause the building to lose eligibility as a designated historic building. That's our challenge. The, um, I've had exactly that where, where people have come in and, and remember when I, when I talked about um, one of our philosophies with historic buildings is respect the existing structure and try to use the existing structure in combination with our new strengthening. A lot of times, that's probably the biggest thing that I will see other structural engineers do is they will just neglect 
any contributing characteristic of the existing structure. They'll just assume that the brick is bad and they don't, they, they'll put in a system neglecting any stiffness or, or, or strength of that existing brick shear wall. They'll just design a system that, that says, oh, that's a facade, or we're gonna just treat that as a, a, a non-structural element. And if it breaks apart and falls apart, that's okay. So that's, that's probably the, the horror story you're, you asked about is seeing projects where the structural engineer does that. They just ignore and neglect the existing structure and feel that they have to totally replace it with a new structure and just not worry about the impact of their design. Yeah, that makes sense. It's holding that like respect for the building paramount helps you balance like the kind of the surgical invisible repairs versus the the reversible ones. Right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, our next question is coming from Ethan. Hi, David. Uh, I really enjoyed your insights on those historical preservation projects that you worked on. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk more about the process that goes into giving your client an estimate on cost, because a lot of times I'm assuming this happens before you sit down with them and talk about the changes that you both want to make. Yeah, well, the, the process is that, um, first of all, we don't do cost estimating, so we get somebody else involved that we can blame it on. Um, but the process is when, when, when we're brought into an existing building, whether it's historical or not, we do an evaluation of that building. And typically we use um, a document, a standard out there called an ASCE 41. The title is Seismic Retrofit, Seismic Evaluation and Retrofit of Existing Structures. And um, that, that's a tiered approach. You can start with a tier one, which is basically no calculations and just a checklist. It was actually, it's like fourth generation of a, of a uh, procedure, a methodology that was thought up by Henry Degenkolb. And um, so we'll do that. We'll go through some level of the ASCE 41 process. And by doing that, what we end up with is a list of deficiencies that we've identified in the building, or at least depending on how sophisticated, what tier you've gone to, some of them are going to be potential deficiencies. They aren't necessarily deficiencies. Um, once we've done that, then we, um, we scratch our heads and we come up with a, uh, a scheme for mitigating those deficiencies, which in the case of Wilshire Boulevard Temple, it was, let's complete these shear walls. You know, let's, let's go on and take away this, these discontinuous shear walls, for example. So <clears throat> we'll put that list together and... <clears throat> the owner will recommend to the owner that they um, send that list out to a cost estimator of some kind, either a general contractor. Wait a minute, let me get a sip. General contractor or a cost estimator and he'll put a number on that. And so, um, you know, you'll, you might have 10 items on your list and we will prioritize them. And the first one might be $100,000 and the last one might be a million dollars for all we know. Um, but we'll, we'll work with them and decide somewhere, we'll either pick the whole list or a portion of that list and how that fits in with the, with the plans of the owner of the building and then put that scope together, match it up with any other work they're planning to do to the building. For example, if we wanna do roof diaphragm strengthening it's a lot easier if the building needs a new roof and the owner is going to put a new roof on it anyway. Then that makes it real simple for us because we've got access to go on and strengthen that roof diaphragm. So we put that together, our recommendations together with the other plans for the building. And, and with that, we can form a scope for the project and then we can move forward from there. And that's basically, at that point, we write a proposal saying, here's what it's gonna take for construction documents, blah, blah, blah. The team is assembled. 
and we, we go on there with the design of the project. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Cool. Um, we're getting, I guess we just hit the 530 mark, but I'll let Francisco um, have the last question. Oh, thanks. Sorry. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I just wanted to get us back to, to that like career development path uh, part of the presentation and wanted to like ask you for like, how was your process, uh, especially with that big decision of like leaving Tech and Cove after like being settled and a leader in that company and now decide to open your own practice, right? And how, how was that process to, you know, to make that big change, right? Uh, you just asked the question that every single session uh, I has always been asked every year. I'm disappointed if somebody doesn't ask that question um, because I expect it. Um, and, and so without, you know, naming any names or anything like that, I was, I basically started the office in LA and, and grew it up and I was reporting to you know, the main office up in San Francisco. And business is not always done exactly the same in each, every region. Um, we had grown, we'd opened up an office about a year after LA up in Portland, another office in Salt Lake City, one in Seattle, and then I had opened one in San Diego. And everybody's a little different. Uh, San Diego is certainly different than LA. There's no, you know, that became very clear to me. Um, so at some point it, it became, for me, there was business decisions that I wanted to make running the office as if it's my business. And my, my uh, decisions were being questioned. Mm. And I felt like I was, you know, feet on the ground. I knew what was happening in the region where I was conducting business. And so it was beginning to stress me. And, you know, whether I'm right or I'm wrong, it was... I just started getting stressed about it. And so um, the quick story is I was driving home on a Friday night. I lived in, uh, it was about an hour and 15 minute commute each way from Santa Monica down to the South Bay where I live. And it was seven o'clock on a Friday night. So that already tells you what kind of week it was. And I was driving home and I got about halfway home and all of a sudden it just hit me. And I said, why am I doing this? I, you know, I could do this on my own and not worry about all that pressure from up above. And any pressure, anytime I make a mistake, if I make a bad decision, then I just beat myself up and then I move on. I don't have to worry about somebody else beating me up. Maybe my wife, but other than that. So um, I was about halfway home and I called my wife on the cell phone and I said, I just decided I'm going to start my own firm. And she said, what took you so long? So <laughs> that was December 2nd, 1999. No, 2000, right. And um, so the next morning I got up and started writing a business plan. And um, I planned to resign in uh, mid-April. I went and got a corporate lawyer, got our corporate, you know, license, got incorporated our name, did all, did all the stuff I needed to do. The only time I felt the stress relief was immediate. Um, I, just real quickly, I, my wife had quit her career at Bechtel as a project manager <clears throat> to start uh, elementary school teaching. She got credentialed the same month that I made that decision. And so I started talking about hiring an admin financial person. And she said, well, I'll just do it for a couple of years. And then when we can afford to hire somebody, then we'll hire somebody else. And we were having our 20th company anniversary in April and she's still the CFO and runs the place. Um, so I, um, I forgot where I was going with that. So I resigned in April. My biggest fear, the only thing that used to wake me up at night was wondering whether I could convince anybody to come work for me. Because I was afraid I was going to have to do all the work myself. And I, I had decided I did not want to be a sole practitioner just doing small projects. I wanted to do bigger projects that I was used to doing. 
And um, I was very fortunate that I had four of the engineers that I had hired while at Degen Cold all eventually raised their hand and said, I want to come work for you. And two of them are still with me and are partners in the firm now and are going to be taking over the firm when I step out of the leadership role sometime soon. Um, so it's been great. I have never looked back. I really enjoy it. I, I, uh, and we've been able to do the projects that I want to do. I think I told some of you guys earlier, we don't do any OSHPOD work. We don't do any DSA work. Those are, those are the hospitals and the public schools. I did enough of that at Degen Kolb and there's enough bureaucracy there. I just said, I'm done with that. I'm not going to do it anymore. As long as I can financially survive, I'm fine. And we've been able to do that. So I'm, I'm very, very thankful. So that's my story. Did that answer your question or is probably way more than you wanted to know? No, that was, that was great. Thank you very much for sharing on that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So I will say though, to add to that, because again, you can all have goals to run your own firm. That wasn't necessarily my goal. My goal was to be working in the structural engineering world, designing really cool projects, working with really good people, which I think you might've heard earlier today, and um, wherever that led me would be fine. Um, I happen to love managing people and I happen to love talking to clients. And I could have done that within Degen Kolb and I could have done that within another firm or I could just do it on my own. I did not start out to have my own firm. And so I think Ken O'Dell said it earlier today for all of you, don't be in a rush, you know, don't. Don't feel like there's a fast track that you have to be on to get somewhere in the structural engineering world. Find out what you're really passionate about. Find out where your interests are and then carefully figure out the best way to get there, whatever that path might be. So that's my last piece of preaching, which I said I wasn't going to do. Thanks, David. You're welcome. Great, thank you, David. Um, and before we end, um, David mentioned to me that he has a little bit of extra time at the end of this session. So if people wanna stick around, I'll leave the Zoom meeting open for you to ask additional questions. Otherwise, um, thanks again, David, for joining us and giving this um, very interesting presentation, as well as sticking around with us throughout the afternoon. Um, and everyone else, thanks for coming along and listening to the presentation. Um, and now you're free to go. Great. Yeah, I can be here at least till six if anybody wants to talk. Otherwise, I'm happy to go to either way you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Nick, thank you. Thank you, all the officers. You guys did a great job setting today up. Really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks so much for your time today, David. It was a great afternoon. Good. I enjoyed it too. Good. Have a good night. Okay. Anybody else have anything you want to say? I have Please. a quick question. Yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, I was wondering if you uh, could talk about what it was like getting your first project, um, like for a structural focus. <laughs> like, um. Well, I'll tell you the first, no, I, I'll tell you the first three projects. And the, this is quick. The first project was um, somebody was looking to buy a building. And um, I, I, I think, I, yeah, I knew who they were. They wanted me to go look at a commercial building, look at the drawings and tell them what I thought. Kind of a quick due diligence. So my fee was $2,000. And a digital camera back then cost about $500. And I didn't have a digital camera. And so I looked to my wife, who was the CFO, and I said, can I go buy a digital camera now? You know, because I got this $3,000 or whatever it was check in my hand so I can afford to get a digital camera now. And she went, yeah, I think you need that. So that was my first job. My second job was for Warner Brothers, who I had done a bunch of work with, but I always had a staff to actually do the drafting and everything else. And so I had to hand draft a, a set of drawings that was extremely painful. 
Um, it was a simple design, but I had to do the calcs. I had to do everything because it was just me. And, um, and it was a good client. So I wasn't going to turn it down and I wasn't going to say, I can't do this, you know, so I had to do that. It wasn't a whole building. It was like a, it was like a waterfall monument, something out of Brockheimer's office or something like that, you know. Then the third project was a fee of $290,000 for a 300,000 square foot uh, laboratory building. And um, so I went from, you know, 3,000 ish to probably 5,000 ish to $300,000 ish. And I immediately, my, my, it was actually, um, the project had kind of been in the works and I knew about it, but I wasn't, there was no guarantee we were gonna get it. And so about a month after I started working, I got a call from my friend who ran an architecture firm and another friend who was a project manager owner's rep. And they said, okay, it looks like we're going forward with this project. They said, we want you to be the structural. Do you have any staff? And I said, okay, put aside, you know, the professional relationship. You guys are my buddies. Do you recommend I go hire a couple of engineers now? Because I wasn't going to hire anybody until I had work for them. And they said, yes, go hire your engineers. And I went, okay, we're done. So I went and hired them. Um, unfortunately, the only bad news to that whole thing was they took like five months to pay. And I had hardly any cash. So it got to be a little scary toward the end of that. And we got a $60,000 check. I remember one day and we were like, Ooh, $60,000. <laughs> and one of the guys said, I guess I can come back to work on Monday now. Right. When yes, you can. So that's, that's my first projects story. I have a question about how you mentioned how Dagan Cole was working with only Oshpods and DSA projects. Do you think as a grad student that's, or as an um, intern, it's better to be exposed to those type of projects? Or do you think it's better to be a part of like those extraordinary projects that Structural Focus works on? I, first of all, they don't only do that. We actually compete with them on, on historic projects and, and in commercial projects. So they do a lot of that. That's, yeah. I think that's probably 50% of their work. Uh, actually, they don't even do much DSA. It's mostly... Uh, a lot of Oshpod projects. Yeah. Um, and I need to tell you that some of my best friends still work at Degen Kolb. Um, Mary Ann Phipps was a principal at Degen Kolb with me. That's how I got to know her. And I don't know if she said anything about that last year, but she still does the Oshpod work. Um, I think it has to do with your interests and, and maybe... It, it wouldn't hurt to do it and see what you think of the process. Mm -hmm. the, um, if you're going to work as an intern and work on an Oshpod process, pro progress, pro that project, I'm not sure how much of the Oshpod process you're going to be exposed to um, because, you know, that's where all the documentation is put together and you send it into Oshpod and they have to review it and comment on it and all that stuff. So you may not get exposed to it very much, even if you are there working on a Oshpod project. Um, where my, where my uh, and Marianne would shoot me for saying this is, um, cause I do, I, I agree with her, the non-structural part of seismic bracing is extremely important especially in a hospital you've got to have all the all the utilities working and all the equipment working and all that and that's what she's a big proponent of that and that's what her firm mostly does i hate that stuff i was stuck on a project doing pipe bracing of an existing hospital early in my career and it drove me crazy so uh, my attitude has always been, I want to design the building and I want to let somebody else do the bracing of the non-structural elements. So in fact, when we, sometimes we will team up with Mary Ann and I, you've got the non-structural, I've got the structural. Um, but that's the reason I really didn't 
want to do it is I didn't want us to be responsible. Not that I didn't want to be responsible, but I didn't want, I didn't want to have to deal with, with the non-structural seismic work. Um, I, it's just not my interest. And, and so we don't do it. Yeah. I interned with KPFF last summer and I felt like it was a lot of DSA and Oshpod, but uh -huh. what I got exposed to was a lot of the non-structural components. So like I say like anchorages and then like trellis design. So, I mean, it wasn't too much um, exposure, but I just wanted to get your perspective out of it. Well, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Though. Exactly, yes, I know exactly yeah. what you mean. So, um, again, I, I think I said it earlier, when you're, when you're looking for an internship or your career, <clears throat> look at the firms that, go to each firm and figure out what kind of work they do. You know, what, what is it that they really do and if whether they're doing the kinds of projects that you want to do. Both KPFF and Degenkolb do great work, and it's not all um, it's not all Oshpod and DSA. Mm -hmm. you know, um, KPFF does work at NBC Universal, so we we compete with them in in the on the studio lots often. So they're and they're good guys. I the leadership at KPFF they're really great guys, uh, and Degenkolb. I mean, I get along really super with them. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? All right. I guess I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious um, if you've interacted with a lot of other student chapters during the pandemic at all, and if you have any like suggestions for us. No. Okay. <laughs> question. Uh, no is the answer. Let's see. Cal Poly asked if I would do another presentation this year. And I actually suggested to them, are you guys still there? Am I frozen? Yeah, you're frozen a little bit, but we can hear you. Are you back? Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, everybody froze. So I figured I was in trouble. Um, Cal Poly actually approached me and um, I suggested that I get one of our other principals to, to present to them because I'd done it like twice in a row or something. Mm -hmm. um, so he presented two or three weeks ago there. Um, like I said, I'm going to Oregon State, I think in about a month and that's it. Um, I do, and I'm not kidding here. You guys, this program this afternoon was perfect. It was the ideal for me, it's what I enjoy is talking with students, answering questions, um, just that interaction. That's my favorite part of, of these, um, these visits that we do. Um, I've sat, I've been at other schools where we'll just sit down in a small conference room and there might be eight or 10 of us and we'll have coffee and they'll just pepper me with questions like you guys are doing and like you did earlier today. And that, to me, that's the, the best part of the whole thing. Um, so I, I, even when we go back to in-person visits, um, this, these activities that you put together today are really good. I would, I would recommend them for anybody else. And when you write your report back to you, you're supposed to file a report, I think, you know, Yeah, yeah. when you do that, um, I, I would tell you to talk about these activities that you planned and I'm going to, write a report saying how much I enjoyed this because I think they're very appropriate. I, as I said earlier, I don't, I don't see a need and I, frankly, I don't want to get into a big technical, highly technical presentation with you. I'd rather talk about the projects we do, some lessons learned and a little bit about, you know, our future. Great, yeah, yeah. I agree. Like, I feel like there were a lot of people today said like they really enjoyed like hearing big picture things because we do like on the day to day get caught up in like the technical details get like, like, like even just like sometimes overwhelmed with some of the huge projects and stuff. And I think there's not a lot of talk in our program about what's next, putting it into context of what the service we mm -hmm. provide to even the community is and it's not necessarily because like, it's not important. It's just like the reality when you just having to like learn all this technical stuff. So your, your, your talk today and the conversations that we had, it's really coming at the right time. And it's, it's coming at a time when a lot of the students will 
are thinking about the next step, right? Because like students will be done with the program probably by maybe either like the end of this year at latest probably March. And so like, yeah. I think that your words will stick with them for sure in the transition, yeah. you know? Yeah, and you can let them know too. If anybody uh, wants to <clears throat> reach out to me just to find, if they think in the middle of the night, oh, I've, there's a question I should have asked, feel free to give them my email and tell them they can reach out to me. Okay. For sure, we appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, to be very honest with you, this is one of the funnest things I do. And mm -hmm. I love mentoring uh, young engineers. I mean, it's, it's just a blast. And you will find... I think you will find that um, any of the leadership, the you know the 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 major organizations like SEI, EERI, NCSEA, or Case, they're all the same way. They all that's that's why we talk about the future because we're trying to make the profession better for the young engineers that are coming in, and we enjoy mentoring them. Are any of you members of SEI or ASCE? Uh, sort of. I, I'm a member of ASE, I think. I don't think I'm a member of SEI. <laughs> Look into it. It's they've got yeah. some really great programs. Um, so, and Ethan, I'm glad you're a member of ASCE. You should, you know, when they um, SEI has a structures congress in the spring every year. Mm -hmm. um, obviously not this year, and um, it, it moves all over the country. And they have scholarships if you get involved in their their I forgot what it's called. Young member, I, uh, you can look online. But if you're you're involved in their, their young member group, student group, there's actually scholarships for travel to the Congress, and um, they're a much bigger Congress. There's usually like 1,200 people there, and there's a big range of programs that you can go to, and they do a lot for networking, you know, and introducing young members to, to the more senior members. There's a lot there. Um, I, I think it's more useful than going to an ASCE conference um, because it's more specialized and structural. Um, and it's, it's really a great organization. Um, so there's a lot there. Go to their webpage and check it out and then check out that vision document too. You might find that interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Yeah. All right. Well, great seeing you guys. Thanks again. I great job today and I enjoyed, enjoyed it very much. Yeah. We're really glad that you enjoyed it. And I think we all got a lot of, out of it as well. So yeah. We all appreciate right. it. Y'all cool. take care. Thanks, David. Okay. Thank you, David. Bye. Take care. Bye.